So, you know, this talk is about reversing climate change. Um, that's been a major theme going through the conference, and we wanted to provide some time to go into a little bit more depth. And so I'll start off the panel by just going down the line. We'll start with Seth here. Uh, tell us your name and tell us a little bit about yourself. I know we just saw you on stage, but how you got into this and, uh, and why it's important to you. If I could do a minute and a half to two minutes for each of you. Sure. Um, thanks, Chris. My name is Seth Itzcan. I'm the co-founder of a new group called Soil for Climate. Uh, my colleague, Carl Thiedemann, has uh, been instrumental in helping me start that. And um, the purpose of that group is to elevate soil to its proper place in the climate narrative. And soil is how we actually reverse global warming. Uh, we need to stop burning fossil fuels, of course, um, because that sort of will level out uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere, but that won't stop the warming. To stop the warming, we really need to bring the CO2 down significantly, and the sink or sponge for that is in soil. And that topic itself needs to be better represented in the, in the climate discussions, and so the purpose of Soil for Climate is to help to elevate that discussion, and, and I'm happy to be here with other groups, such as the Carbon Underground, um, and the, the Soil Story folks, the Kiss the Ground folks that were here the other night. And there are other great groups who aren't here right now, but they're trying to um, promulgate this message. So I really think this is one of the most important messages. And, and that's actually how I got into the whole savory thing, was because I was a climate activist and I became aware of the potential of soils and of, of grasslands. And so that's how I got into savory and holistic management and ranching. I mean, I never would have thought that I would be doing that. Um, and yet, here I am now, a huge proponent for it. OK. That's good enough. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, hi, I'm Peter Bick, and I'm a filmmaker, and I'm a professor of practices at Arizona State University, the School of Journalism and School of Sustainability. I, uh, when, when my team and I were making Carbon Nation, uh, a, doc, a documentary feature film, we were looking for solutions to climate change. And in that film, the research was showing that we found that soils were about the most powerful way to start bringing down CO2 from the atmosphere, just like Seth was saying. Uh, because unless we bring down more than we're putting up and we're not slowing down on putting up, we're going to get warmer and warmer. Um, and then when you start looking into all the benefits of what happens when you get carbon in the soil with water retention and food health, animal health, wildlife happiness, it just seems like a, 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 a very good idea all the way around. One of the projects that I'm a part of is to work with the oil business, specifically Shell Oil, to see if the ranchers who are putting carbon in the soil, uh, if that could be a useful business uh, asset for an oil company because they're spending billions of dollars on carbon capture and storage mechanically with pumps and compressors, pipes and compressors. Why not use the soil and see if they could get the same or better results for a lot less money. And so we're working on that. It's a project called Million Tons Pilot, and uh, there's a lot more to talk about. <laughs> Good morning, Jason Roundtree. I'm an associate professor at Michigan State University. Uh, I uh, work and coordinate a, a research facility by the name of Lake City Research Center in Lake City, Michigan, which is also a um, working to finalize, but uh, have, have passed all of our accreditation to be a savory hub. Our overarching mission is to uh, essentially uh, implement triple bottom line agriculture research and education uh, for our students and for our community. Does this work? Yeah, this works. My name is Tom Newmark. I am the co-founder and chair of the Carbon Underground, uh, which is an organization, as Seth mentioned, uh, that is helping to promote the awareness that there is a solution to the climate crisis. I actually do wake up hopeful every morning. I know the challenges are daunting, but the solutions are uh, enticing and, in fact, delicious. I'm also the co-founder uh, and one of the steering committee members of a new organization called Regeneration International, which is an umbrella organization of the Carbon Underground, the Organic Consumers Association, Navdanya, IFOM, and the Millennium Institute, together with Mercola.com. And we've organized uh, educational uh, uh, rallies, conferences, summits around the world to bring out this message of the 
reversal of climate change through uh, regenerative organic agriculture. And finally, I have, with my wife and my partner Stephen Farrell, uh, a certified biodynamic farm and ranch in Costa Rica, and it's called Finca Luna Nueva, and we invite all of you to come and see how in the hot, humid rainforest on the Caribbean slope, we can actually farm and ranch in a way that puts carbon underground. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Teague. I'm a professor with the Texas a and University System. I'm a research scientist, and the focus of my research is to determine what is the management that best restores ecological function and human resilience. And in my quest for the best management, uh, I always end up on a, an holistic uh, planned grazing farm, and I've measured the impact that they've had relative to a more a traditional management, and in terms of putting carbon in the ground, biodiversity, uh, people making a living, they are way ahead of the pack. It's all published. <laughs> so Peter, I want to start with a question for you. What is climate change? Let's start at square one, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. you got scientists on this panel, you're asking me. Um, <laughs> climate change is basically, um, with, with, I'll just talk about CO2. CO2 is a, is, a global, is a greenhouse gas, so it basically absorbs more infrared energy from the sun. And when the energy is not bouncing back out into space because it's being captured by the CO2, the earth is getting warmer. It's like a blanket. It's just like a greenhouse. It's just like your car gets hot and you don't leave your dog or your kid in the car right. when, on a hot day or you know, any day. Um, we're basically doing that with the planet. And it, it's, as Judith Schwartz says, it's not a carbon problem. It's just a placement situation. Right. So right? we've rolled just, up the windows just, in the car. It's just the carbon's up there. And if we get it back in the soil where a lot of the carbon up there is from in the first place, um, we'll be able to balance things out. So that's in essence my second question then. Is carbon a good thing or a bad thing? I love it. I wouldn't be here without it. That's I right. don't wake up. I mean, it's, it's a right. building block of life, right? Right. So it is a very good thing. And, and, and carbon dioxide is a very good thing. It's just we have too much up there. It's, it's not a political thing. It's, not a, it's just physics and chemistry. Right. And um, you can go to Venus and have the same situation where they've got too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Yet Venus is just as hot as Mercury, but Venus is twice as far from the sun as Mercury. Right. It's just, and I don't think there's political parties on Venus that I know of. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just very much a, a, a cut and dry thing right. that has been stirred up. Right. Um, but it's been stirred up by people who don't want to change. That's all. It's just business. And if you were in a business that was going to have to make less money if you changed, you'd probably be fighting for your business too. So that even makes sense to me. Right. So. So then in the simplest terms, how does carbon dioxide get into the soil? And I'll open this up to the group. Um, <clears throat> multitude of ways. Um, ultimately, we need to consider the fact that we're dealing with a complex system. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we know through energy flow and through, of, of course, photosynthesis, um, that's the greatest way to do so. But concurrently, uh, we also know that the greater the biodiversity in a system, the greater niches we form because of the emergent properties of that complex system. And so thus then the greater the biodiversity, the actual more energy that we can suck into that system as it goes to a greater level of stability. Mm -hmm. So we can do it through photosynthesis, we can do it through management. And then also what we do with the landscape over time can, can really um, alter where the, the, the CO2 or the carbon is stored and we know that as man we're key disruptors but ultimately because of our management we can really alter those energy flows which in turn will dramatically um, improve hopefully through management our, our water cycles mineral cycles yeah. and the living organisms we manage yeah Tom did you have something to add to that it looked like maybe you were yeah I'm thinking that uh, that we may have been the architects of the damage and our limited intelligence is, uh, has, has quite vexed the ecosystem in which we reside. And I think that we need to now look to the unlimited intelligence uh, of microorganisms, of all plant life. We have to outsource this problem because we humans may have caused it, but we humans alone can't solve it. And I'd like to rely on the 
the numberless near infinities of organisms in the soil and plants and animals above ground because they are the ones that will actually put the carbon back underground. We just have to work with them rather than working against them. Right. Right. And I'll give a little bit more insight to that. So if you're unfamiliar, you've got a, a plant there that is able to use energy from the sun to break down a couple of compounds that are available to it. So you've got CO2, that's the carbon dioxide that we're talking about, in the air. And then you have H2O, water, in the soil. And it's pretty simple. The plant is able to break out the carbon, the carbo, of that uh, carbon dioxide in the air and the hydrogen from the H2O, from the water, and make a carbohydrate, a sugar. And it stores those sugars in the soil uh, and then releases what's left over back into the atmosphere, which is oxygen. So in theory, it's a pretty simple process. We want as much of it to happen as possible. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about livestock at this conference. Uh, I want to open to the group. How can livestock enhance that? How can we uh, make more of that happen? Go ahead, Richard. To get more carbon in the soil, you've got to minimize losses and increase the amount of carbon that's being pulled into the soil. If you've got bare ground, that's what loses carbon, and you're shedding water at the same time, which decreases productivity and photosynthesis. So you've got to manage to decrease bare ground, increase productivity, get the rainfall in the ground, and you've got to plan and graze according to changing circumstances to do that. That's what holistic management does very well. Anyone else have anything to add to that? So in essence, if you've got a, a grass plant that's, that's here above the soil, there's usually equal amount, if not more, amount of biomass below the soil. And so what happens when an animal comes in and takes a bite of that, whether it's a wild ruminant or a domestic one, um, the plant's its solar collectors are damaged. It doesn't have a way to get energy from the sun the same way anymore. So what it does, it takes some of those stored sugars in the roots and it allocates them up to be able to regrow the, the blade of grass up here, regrow that solar collector. But what it does in that process is it actually lets some of that bottom root die off, slough off. Um, and that, that died off root actually becomes organic matter that feeds the soil and helps humus continue to establish, establish and get more soil organic matter. And so um, as livestock go through, if we manage them correctly uh, as a domestic beast that we can control where they go and when they are and for how long and for the right reasons and with the right behavior and all of those things, we can control how that process goes, that pumping of organic matter into the soil and that organic matter came from carbon dioxide out in the air. So um, the correct management of livestock, uh, as Alan would say, is the only tool to be able to do this on scale uh, on a global level. Chris, can I add something to that? Yes, Seth, please. So, um, oh, okay. um, so for me, like I said, when I got into this, I wasn't thinking about livestock at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had this sort of the technical, the windmills and the, the solar panels and all of which, of course, uh, we absolutely need zero emission cars. Um, but it was always a technical paradigm. Um, the whole biological paradigm was itself uh, actually new to me. And, um, and I was even somewhat resistant to it. Explain it's, that. Well, as if it was sort of a bad thing to be an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, and my idea of being an environmentalist was to make a website for an environmental organization. You know, or to create a database of environmentalists so they could talk to each other. Like, oh, well, I'm doing a good thing. But to actually be in nature and to, to walk with the herders and, and to actually pick up the dirt and, and to start to understand the science of what's going on in soil has, has been a, a mind change for me. And then to go to Africa and to see the people there, they're not talking about climate change. They're talking about water and food. I mean, climate change is a, like a first world problem. <laughs> And concern. <laughs> con concern. Yeah. Concern, right. It's yeah. a global problem. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, you know, I want to do this for these people. You know, I want these people to have water and to have food. Right. And whether or not the academics in Boston and New York understand this is about climate is almost a second concern when you're seeing that the people, you know, on the ground there just need to drink. Um, and water is probably going to be one of the strongest selling points for this. Right. I was just going to also follow up uh, from the animal uh, perspective and, and reiterate that livestock are a tool. Mm -hmm. And we can't necessarily control that complex system, but we can use what we know through technology and through the use of tools and animal impact to impart these changes that we want. But it all begins with management yeah. and having a holistic plan grazing 
and uh, other there are other strategies potentially out there. But but the point is is that it has to be management driven. We can't turn livestock out and just expect these wonderful things to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be a positive tool and they can be a negative tool, and we must understand that through management we can encourage in this complex system the things that we want uh, through our holistic context that we're working from. I'm going to follow up with you, and thanks for that clarification. If I, no, with you, Jason, if, if I'm, if I'm a, a rancher and I'm just moving my animals around in a rotational grazing system, am I there yet? Um, and, and if not, why? <clears throat> well, you know, planned grazing, as you kind of indicated, it's having animals at a certain spot for a certain reason to accomplish something uh, with a given behavior. Mm -hmm. And by just, I'll put it into perspective. When we started really trying to figure this out, it was uh, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and, and even in Louisiana where I managed, we rotationally grazed, mm -hmm. but we just did it. Mm -hmm. And then um, we started wanting to look at the impact of what density does. And stock density would be the amount of pounds of animals that you have on a given acreage for a day. And we started doing that. But ultimately, until um, I really started trying to learn more, and I, I read uh, Jim Howell's book and, and some others, that unless we had a plan and a reason for being there, we were just rotationally grazing. And we didn't, ha we didn't have a plan. We were moving but we really didn't have an articulated reason on why we were moving. We just thought we were being more productive. And the data will say that, the, the, you know, that we can get 30 to 40% more use out of a landscape by moving. Mm -hmm. But I think we can even do much greater Absolutely. by having, having a planned grazing program. And so to me, having a plan and a reason and a purpose using behavior is considerably different than any other grazing system that I'm aware of. Yeah, and so to clarify on that uh, on that planning process, one of, there's many things that you might plan into that. Everything from your cash flow to uh, other environmental factors. Maybe there's ground nesting birds in a riparian area, uh, or maybe there's an area that you want to leave uh, to wildlife during a certain part of the year. Maybe they're fawning or whatever. Um, all of that goes in the plan. But one of the key drivers in the plan is that recovery time. So I talked about how that root sloughs off. Well, when that root sloughs off. Now we've, we've got an inverse relationship. Instead of a short blade of grass, we've got a full-size blade of grass, but the root hasn't had time to recover. We don't want to graze again until that root has had time to fully regrow. And so that's that recovery period. So we don't want to regraze until we get back until that uh, has fully happened. And so that's one of the first drivers on that plan is I don't come back into an area until we've had full recovery happen. Um, and so rotational grazing has, n has no way of building that into the plan. If just every day you're reactively going, oh, gee, is there feed in here or not feed in here, you might go all the way back to the loop and come back to the beginning and be way ahead of, of uh, schedule in the wrong way, and those plants haven't had time to recover yet. And so by planning the whole process out in advance, you're able to see those things ahead of time and know where you need to be and when. So I, I, go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and ultimately I think you have to have flexibility built in the model mm -hmm. because you don't know what nature will throw at you and Richard can probably also comment that you know we also in our system we do uh, bi-weekly grazing wedges where we walk in our system it's a fairly small system highly productive but you know only a thousand acres that we have an ongoing total of how much standing forage that we have in every pasture at, at our farm and through that and with our holistic uh, plan grazing with our plan that, that we can we can make the flexibility we need to to maybe, to, 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 you know, the, the nature doesn't respond how we think it is. And we, we thought we might needed to be in pasture 36A, but ultimately we need to be at, at a different spot. And mm -hmm. so it also, the, the other thing that's important is the social dynamic mm -hmm. because there's, there's a quality of life factor that all Absolutely. enters into this as well. And, and just because we say to move them five times a day or something might give you an, a response, it may hurt a marriage or, you know, it may, may, not be the may, life you want. Uh, may alter other things negatively. So. Absolutely. Tom, I think you had something you wanted to say on that? Yeah, I wanted to circle back to the, the larger issue of reversing climate change. And we all appreciate on this panel and in the audience and people who are, who are watching this that we have to put carbon back in the soil. It's the only available sink. And, and, we, and we, we know that the technology of holistic livestock management, thank you, Mr. Savory, is an extraordinary technology for doing that on the 3.5 billion hectares of grasslands on the planet.
but when we're talking about reversing climate change, we have a broader land palette to consider. We also need to consider wetlands and forests and arable lands. And I don't want to neglect the 1.5 billion hectares of farmland. And I know as a regenerative organic farmer and, and working with them, that there is a considerable quantity of CO2 in the billions and billions of tons per year that can be sequestered using regenerative organic agriculture, which uses so many of the same principles as the holistic management of grasslands. They, they work so well together. I just wanted to reintroduce that as part of the solution. Yeah. Okay, so you know, we've, we've drawn a good case for livestock so far, but without going and, and taking the next 30 minutes, because that's what we have left here, but I want to make sure that we address the point of most of the general public has heard that livestock create negative emissions, that, that even if we're sequestering some carbon, um, that the emissions of methane and, and um, the carbon dioxide produced from their own production outweighs any of that benefit. Can we talk about that a little bit? When people make those assertions, they're generally looking at a small part of an ecosystem and they're trying to make a particular point that supports their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. In order to understand the subject adequately, you have to look at the whole ecosystem that you're dealing with and consider all elements in it. Mm -hmm. When you do that, when you consider that in growing beef, if you're using a feedlot, uh, there's a, 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 a greenhouse gas signature that comes with feeding corn mm -hmm. because of the erosion, because of all the inputs that go there. Unless you take those things into account, you will falsely associate all the missions in GHG signature with beef cattle. But when you look at it and describe where each one of those uh, signatures is coming from, you quickly find out that feeding on grass, which fixes more carbon in, in sequestration than the emissions from those animals, then you realize that there's an alternative to doing that so you can avoid the GHG um, negative signature from mainstream agriculture. So looking at the whole picture and doing a, a complete analysis is the end point, and few people have done that yet. Yeah. On the issue of methane, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a, uh, a, an inconvenient fiction that we need to rebut. It's a heresy that has to get squashed yeah. because the, the environment has the ability to to metabolize, to oxidize methane. Methane is a, is a delicious ice cream fuel source for methanotropic bacteria. And I've, I've asked Dr. Christine Jones, uh, familiar to many of you, well, what about the ability of a healthy grassland to, to metabolize the methane that is produced uh, by ruminants? And she said, in fact, in a healthy ecosystem, the methanotropic bacteria in the soil will be able to actually metabolize more than the amount of methane produced by the livestock, and that a well-managed system actually is a methane sink and not a methane source. So I think that it's, it's, it's very important, as, as, as Richard said, to look at this as an entire system, not to simply look at, at cattle belching methane, but look at what does the ecosystem do in response to that fuel source. And I think it's also to follow up, um, you know, we have three primarily, uh, three primary uh, gases that we look at, CO2, CH4, which is methane, and then nitrous oxide. Um, using the EPA and environmental factor adjustments, uh, one unit of CO2 is, is effectively 25 units of methane. So one unit of methane is 25 times more potent than, than CO2. And then uh, N2O nitrous oxide is 300. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so there's a huge signature there. And so um, our, our work would suggest when we look at a normal grazing system that if we incorporate CO2, and, and granted CO2 is the, it is the, the currency of metabolism in the soil. So when we have CO2 coming off the soil, that also indicates there's a lot of metabolism going on below as well. And so th the fact though is that when we look at our overall 
a system and through through three or four years of monitoring that including CO2, the enteric methane from beef cattle in our system only add maybe 20% more overall adjusted CO2 equivalents into the atmosphere. But the things that we also have to consider then is we also are producing in our system on a uh, around uh, 300 or 250 kilos of beef per unit land, per unit hectare, or actually even somewhere it can be even higher in that process. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that we know that it takes much less sequestered carbon to offset that enteric methane footprint. Mm -hmm. it, it can dramatically change just a little bit of carbon, say one metric ton per hectare per year, can really offset a majority of the overall enteric, uh, the enteric footprint that, that we see. And so the final thing, and I'll hush, is that we also know that metanotrophic bacteria indeed can do the things that Tom suggested. They're highly sensitive to fertilizers and they're highly sensitive to herbicides. And so those are the aspects that we have to also consider that can dramatically change those bacterial communities, which in fact can detour those opportunities that we know nature provides us. But, but when you're talking about nitrogen, um, and then Richard, you were talking about corn production, you know, the majority of cattle in the United States at least are fed corn, and nitrogen fertilizer is a big part of that. So when you all are doing the life cycle analysis of, of the, you know, in, in Iowa alone, when a pound of corn is harvested, two pounds of soil is lost to erosion. There's a lot of carbon in that soil, and that's just a bad thing all the way around. So a lot of nitrogen in that system, too, washing down the Mississippi, causing dead zones at the end of the Gulf of Mexico. But when you, when you do the life cycle analysis that we're, that we're working on, I know the corn and the carbon pieces there are you all looking at the nitrogen as well in that LCA? In the LCA into, is life in the cycle analysis. Life cycle analysis, the N2O, Richard, or, or Jason? Yep. The work we've been doing hasn't it's just been a, a baseline, but the work that we're planning with our team actually will address that directly. Yeah, because that, that, that could be huge, could it not? Indeed. We, I mean, going to the literature, uh, Camargo et al., which is an outstanding paper from Pennsylvania State in 2013, uh, has done quite a bit of life cycle analysis on different plant communities and different farming practices. Uh, you can take that work, you can also take work done out of Cornell with Pimentel, and effectively they typically don't look at mixed pasture models and compare to corn. What they more aptly look at is uh, the you know, alfalfa. In our upper Midwest region, alfalfa related to corn. Generally the data would suggest that uh, for every kilocalorie of energy that goes into a corn model, you can reap somewhere around two and a half out. In an alfalfa model, it can be six and a half to seven out. So ultimately, because of the fact that we're not having to use nitrogen, again, alfalfa, a nitrogen-fixing lagoon, we, we can get almost two to three times the energy uh, from that alfalfa versus corn because it doesn't have the 200 plus units of, of nitrogen placed on it every year. And so that's a, a key indicator. And those factors that we, we do, we do factor that in uh, to our models. And, and ultimately, there, there's some very, um, good data. Now that also doesn't demagogue the corn industry either. It just says, can we farm corn in a way that reduces the overall footprint in a standpoint of keeping the ground covered with cover crops mm. and using better and smarter rotations and also including grazing into those cropping systems mm -hmm. to keep soil where it needs to be and to lower the overall nitrogen footprint that comes with them as well. There are farmers that I see that farm or or organically or not even that, that can keep soil where it needs to be and dramatically lower their nitrogen. So you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. It all goes back to management and planning. I was just going to ask along all the things we've just been talking about, you know, how expensive it is to put the fertilizer in, how expensive it is to have all these inputs. You know, what about the rancher, the farmer, and their income? You know, isn't, are, are, are we saying that someone could be doing everything that we're suggesting and make more money, less money? Is it harder? Is it easier? Those are the questions I get quite a bit. I deal specifically, I find the people who are doing a good job using biological means, living in the biological paradigm, to compare with the current industrial chemical paradigm. So I'm looking for those things. And there are numerous people right around the world who have moved completely to the biological paradigm with no pesticides um, or, or inorganic inputs that are getting the same yields after they've built up their soil with less inputs, and the overall profitability is many times higher. The leading guys are up at 6x profit compared to where they started, 
and at least that much more than their neighbors. So yes, it can be done. It's a transition problem. We've got to learn how to do it, and we've got to teach people that they actually can do it because people are scared as hell of change. Yeah. In the beef industry, 80 to 90 percent of the variation in profitability is explained by cost and not by income. 80 to 90 percent of the variation in the beef industry is explained by cost and not income. Therefore, we know the lower cost models that we have in the beef industry are much more influential on overall net profit compared to the amount of income that we get for the animal. And that's something that we have to, to always keep in mind. So generally speaking then, the lower input our models can be, typically the more profitability that we see. And it's important not per unit animal, but per unit land. And that's something that we get very tied into <coughs> is looking at income per unit animal. But we need you to look at it at a bigger system level. And we know that, that those lower input models are indeed more profitable when it comes to beef production. And others in integrated cropping and livestock systems as well, uh, Colin and Gabe and, and many others that, that we're well aware of can, can also show that through the integration of animals into those systems, they've all but, but completely gotten rid of, of the, their nitrogen footprint mm -hmm. in terms of fertilization and things like that. So they're also getting that exponential effect below ground because they're not disrupting the biological communities that are naturally fixing nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Seth has a comment to add to that, and then we're going to move on. Right, so um, <clears throat> regarding the, the methane question, um, this is really an issue of a reductionist uh, view or approach versus a holistic view or approach. And so th the methane emerges as a problem because there's a, re a reductionist evaluation of a reductionist paradigm. You know, so you're just measuring um, the methane coming from a cow that's part of an industrial reductionist system. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole system is absurd. You know, it, there, there will be a million things wrong with it. You know, um, it's just one reflection of many things that are wrong with, the, with that approach, as opposed to the holistic approach where the, the megafauna creature, the grazer, is in an ecosystem moving and eating in the way that it's supposed to, helping to build the ecosystem and create soil it has an entirely different footprint in terms of carbon, methane, nitrogen, everything. I mean, it just it makes perfect sense. Methane mm -hmm. is just the result of the biological digestion of cellulose, mm -hmm. of grass. So it could come from a cow. It can come from a termite. It can come from a grasshopper. I mean, anything that eats, breaks down cellulose is going to emit methane. And we need to break down that yeah, cellulose yeah, for yeah. the and, ecosystem to, to thrive and function. Right, obviously. So, I mean, the real data that needs to be gotten is on the sort of gas exchange profile of the entire ecosystem over a long period of time. So if, if many acres are being restored, they're going to be methane negative. They will actually be pulling down methane and, and livestock managed properly will be both CO2 and methane negative. So that's actually a great transition into my next question. Are we at carrying capacity or beyond carrying capacity uh, of the, the planet's ability to support grazers? And what evidence do you have for or against that? All the evidence from the, the paleo past, where we carried many, many more, hundreds of, uh, of times, the number of, of large ruminants. Uh, it's much larger than it used to be. If you look at the carrying capacity of, uh, sorry, the, the amount of animals that is carried by people who are totally in a biological paradigm and who are managing so they've improved their environment, they are carrying four to six times as much as they used to. That is the potential. Can everybody get there? Likely not. But everybody can move forward. Mm -hmm. So we are very much understocked in terms of our potential. And the advantages of doing that for increasing soil carbon if you change your management while using um, the, the necessary numbers um, is huge. You can actually build your future. You don't just have to accept what's there. So you can increase a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, we need to pay attention to language. Um, so even statements like carrying capacity, even that term itself is a defunct term, right? Because 
you're looking at land which is highly degraded. So what difference does it make what the carrying, the carrying kit doesn't mean anything. You want to restore the land. You want to increase the carrying capacity. And, and well, maybe today you can, and, and, and what does it even mean, well, for how long? I mean, for a day, for a year? You know, the, the whole point of, of, of movement is that a lot of animals come in, they impact and they leave. So on that day, it might have a carrying capacity of a thousand animals on that day. But a year later, it might be 2,000. But on a global so, carrying capacity, is there evidence that we could put more ruminants on the planet total, um, or do we need to de decrease the size of the global herd? My, my understanding is that you have to restore the land. Mm -hmm. And that when people start restoring the land, they find they can't keep up with the production. Mm -hmm. They discover, oh my God, we need more animals to keep up. When you mimic nature. And when you mimic nature. And so, and based on what I've heard about what South Africa used to be like, or Southern Africa, with the type of animal density, I don't think we're anywhere near mm -hmm. the, the quote unquote carrying capacity. Uh, using data from Rattan Lal in a 2003 nature paper, he estimated uh, and this has been some years ago, that we've already lost 50 up to 70 percent of the overall uh, carbon that we had in topsoil. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and that, a majority of that happened at the advent of, um, of, of basic, uh, even like early 1930s, of, of generally more industrial oriented agriculture. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question then is, well, how did all that carbon get there in the first place? And as um, Alan has indicated, my colleague Matt Raven, through his reading and others, we know that there were tens of millions of traversing ruminants that were, were building that through ecological processes. And that's widely uh, agreed upon in the, the scientific community. Correct. And so because of that, we know that we held considerably more ruminants ever uh, then. And then just recently, it was almost in my backyard, you know, they, they found the, the mastodon in Michigan. I don't know if you <laughs> saw that on the news. Yeah. This, but that was almost like my neighbor's farm, right? You know, we're, we're right there, you know, but, but it's evidence not long ago in our past, as right. Alan indicated in his talk the other night, that there were, were tens of millions of more. Right. And so what is the common denominator of losing it? Right. What and is so, the common denominator? It's the plow, frankly, and it's, it's that, that basic harvest of all the energy that we stored there. So how do we get it back? And, and there's only really one primary way to do that. And I think that is to mimic what nature has presented us and, and to get considerably more ruminants back into these landscapes. Does it mean we uh, uh, abort farming in the upper Midwest where I'm from? No. Uh, but, but we can be considerably smarter using what we know right to 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 go back to go to go forward so. right so just to, to to clarify that you're saying the scientific community agrees and that richard said it as well that there were many more wild ruminants on this planet ruminants meaning grazers uh in previous points in history than we have wild or domestic today that sure begs the question if that's true um, how could they be the cause of climate change when that wasn't an issue in previous points um, and that maybe management could change and actually help mitigate that back down to what Seth was saying? Yeah, you, 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 can, you can study emissions mm -hmm. and you can almost put the CO2 rise right on top of the, when we began to harvest coal and oil, mm -hmm. and you, you can follow those two and there's a high, high correlation between when we started bringing up fossil fuels uh, with the overall part per million signature. But two things happened with that. Not only were we harvesting that fuel and burning it, but that was also powering the plows, which you just brought up. And, and to providing the natural Turn the soil over and release carbon as well, back which is a byproduct of the natural gas industry. Yeah. And Tom, you wanted to add something to that quickly? Until about 1950, the majority of, of CO2 emissions that were anthropogenic were from sources other than fossil fuel combustion. Yeah. It's, it's a very recent mm -hmm. development that fossil fuel emissions are the uh, primary source, are the, not primary, the, the, uh, pre the, the, the largest source of fossil fuel emissions. Many folks in the environmental community and in policymakers fail to recognize that it was the uh, destruction of till through aggressive industrial extractive farming 
that resulted in the liberation of hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. So I agree with you that, that if you look at, the, at the, the, the CO2 trajectory, there is a correlation to fossil fuel emissions. But frankly, since the dawn of the That's Neolithic right. era, there has been a, a steady creeping up of CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and that accelerated dramatically in the last 50 to 70 years, correlating to industrial agriculture, right. not just fossil fuel emissions. Real quick, Richard. I want to add to what Tom said in his talk before here. Don't think emissions. Think of solutions. Yeah. Solution is get the carbon in the ground, manage accordingly. Right. Great. And to this question specifically to Peter as we, we get to wrapping up here, um, what do you say to someone who doesn't believe in climate change? Um, I don't get into the argument. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the argument and the debate about climate change was so well played by people who wanted to poison the well, I kind of think they won, quite honestly. I, I talk to people about, I look for common ground. And when I say to someone who doesn't question. believe climate change is real, we just very quickly agree to disagree mm -hmm. about that. And then I ask them, do they like clean water? Yes. Clean air? Yes. What do you think about solar power? Love it. Energy efficiency? No brainer. Um, you know, wind? Pretty much. Yeah, love it. And um, then we talk about what do you think about soils? What do you mean? Right? And then that's a whole <laughs> educational conversation about soils. I didn't know much about it myself a few years back. And, and, and we quickly establish a giant amount of common ground, mm -hmm. and we just let the climate thing just stick over there. Yeah. I, I figure folks who don't believe in climate change, all of our work and everybody here and many, many other people are trying to make it so that they don't have to, right? Yeah, it's, it's happening now, but let's, let's, just, let's just, maybe they're right. Yeah. I don't really care. Um, I don't think they're right, really, but what I'm saying is, we got to slow it down. All the work that we're talking about has the potential to do that. And so that's when I get into that conversation, I just take a step right over it. It's, it's not going to get you anywhere. That was great. I avoid the issue. Because if you want to start a fight in certain communities, that's the best way to start a fight. Sure. So I just, everybody understands the need to get carbon in the ground for water and for numerous other things. Focus. You don't achieve things without focusing. Focus on getting carbon in the ground. Everybody gets it. Right. I'll just add one quick thing. I, just a little different uh, a nuance from Richard. I don't avoid it because it's so clear that my whole career is based on the fact that I think climate change is real. I just go to it really quickly, talk about it really quickly, agree to disagree, boom, and then get to the solutions. Right. It's just a little bit of a change. And then, Seth, you describe yourself as a, as a futurist, and so I wanted to ask you this question before we get to our closing question. Describe the worst-case scenario for climate change, and then contrast that with the best-case scenario. Well, um, thanks, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just here to help. <laughs> I actually was going to get to that in, in my slides. And, and, um, you know, the worst case is runaway global warming. Mm -hmm. You know, that we become like Venus. Um, and there's no reason why that can't happen. It's happened before on this planet. Um, CO2 levels have been way higher. And basically, um, the, the world seems to work at sort of um, different levels of, of homeostasis, if you will. You know, it sort of jumps between these different levels where the CO2 is very high or it's here. It, it doesn't just... Um, like hover where we want it to hover. It's a very big, complex system. And when you destroy the grasslands and you put all of this sequestered um, CO2 that's in coal and oil into the atmosphere, you're going to change the paradigm. It's not just going to be a little warmer. It can be dr dramat uh, dramatically warmer. You lose the poles. You lose the whole climate system the way we know it. You lose ox oxygen in the oceans. The oceans can become what's called anoxic. Um, I mean, this is a death spiral. So the end of human civilization and, and possibly I mean, life as we know it. Well, definitely the end of human civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the quote unquote the worst case scenario. But that's a real scenario, and and we have to restore grasslands. We have to stop putting CO2 in the air, and we have to restore grasslands. We have to restore billions of acres of land. 
and <clears throat> the grassland soils, uh, the, the grassland plants are the, one of the best sequesters of atmospheric carbon. They're, they're largely what's called C4 plants. They're very good at pulling carbon out of the air and putting it into long chain molecules. So we absolutely have to do that and we have to work with ruminants to do that. And so the best case scenario is that we start, start restoring the world's grasslands. We, mm. we start right now and right in today. All right, and then I'm gonna go to, to Richard and we're gonna go down the line and give you each a minute to answer this last question in closing. Do we have time to save our planet and what gives you the most hope? Well, the research I've done and recently had published suggests that if we do change from a chemical paradigm to a biological paradigm and start managing well, we will put carbon in the ground that will go a long way to solving our problem. And the figures show, yeah, it can be done. Difficult to know in terms of theory of change what will, what will catalyze the, the paradigm shift. Uh, it is inevitable. Will the world learn to produce uh, protein in a way that is holistic and integrative and supportive of the ecosystem? Will the world learn to produce its foods in a way that regenerates carbon matter in the soil? The answer is, of course the world will, because there is no choice. That's right. And so we're going to find out how long it takes and what event will catalyze the rapidity, the aggressiveness of the transition is yet to be seen. I personally wake up hopeful every morning because I think that uh, common sense and our survival instincts will impel us to take action in the right direction. Um, I think uh, to resonate what's been said, yes. I mean, we, we have the technology, we have the knowledge, we know what to do. And that, that ultimately can make one hopeful. Can we work through the complexity of policy? Can we work through the complexity of change to get there is, is the next step. I'm hopeful because we have, through holistic management, a way forward to addressing that complexity to get there. And so that's what I, I get excited about personally, is when I talk to this about young people at our university, it's like their eyes light up because it's like they've been searching for something different. Right. And you finally present this to them and they, they just get so excited. Mm -hmm. and, and also producers as well who I work with and they give me hope, yeah. the students do. Yeah, great answer. Um, I, I have hope because I've, I've seen these operations, I've seen these ranches, I've seen what's going on, and, um, and I see ranchers doing better. And I see them doing better without subsidies. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole easy thing right there that it's a human choice without a government mandate. Right. Um, there are some government stuff that get in the way. That would be nice to clear that up. Yeah. Um, but I, I, another thing that gives me hope is that nature, in my opinion, nature wants to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, the Sacramento River had a big chemical spill in the 80s, and I remember them saying the river was dead. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, you start reading these little articles in the LA Times down A23 <laughs> that all of a sudden they're seeing life sprouting up much faster than they expected. So um, I think the power of nature is much stronger than any of us kind of know. Tom alluded to it earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got 3.5 billion years of R&D yeah. behind it. And so as long as we start going in sync with nature, I think things can turn around very quickly. And I think people feel better, people feel better when they're working on these systems mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. And I think that's a powerful engine as well. Absolutely. I already answered it, right? All right. <laughs> all right, well with that, let's give our panelists a round of applause.